Being settled. If anybody knows how to turn off the air conditioner in this room, the box is right back there. We could use your help. I think it's a little chilly, and I think a lot of others are, would appreciate that. If you know how, I'm serious. We'd appreciate it. pray. Father, we sing a song there to you that has the feel of the minor key, that has the feel of, of, of lowness and slowness and a, and a touch of, of sorrow. And the words in it also assume the need for mercy. Assume that we are sinful people who stand before you in need and vulnerable, who are crying out to you for something that, that must be given to us or we are in trouble. That's, that's what we just sang and in some ways, that does not appeal to us. It doesn't lift us up and encourage us. It doesn't feel like it belongs in a worship service, maybe. So, Father, I pray that if and as we sit in that moment right now, that you would do a work here that shows us our need for it, the truth of that song. And that shows us its appropriate position within a worship service because what we need and do truly need, you have in fact provided. It is good to be realistic and honest about ourselves and about our need and then to be in, in the moment of, of brokenness, made aware of your goodness. Your goodness to provide for us the mercy that we need, that we cry out for, apart from which we would be lost. We ask you to have mercy on us, and then we can say, thank God for the mercy shown to us in Christ. Lord, this is what we deal with this morning in the passage before us in Luke. Help us to not skip either part, the part about our need to to face that and to actually see it and become convinced of it, and then the part about your provision to see that and to actually become convinced of that and to rejoice in that as well. Both both sides of this, Lord, are are true, and both sides of it need to to be seen and seen together here as we draw near to hear from you and to worship you over your word given to us. So open that word up to us, Spirit of God. Would you make it clear? Would you open our hearts up to us? And I pray, Lord, for the two groups here this morning, for those who know you and those who don't, always, always those two groups. We're in one group or the other, and and I pray, Lord, that you would help us in in both groups, wherever we are, to see your goodness and to draw near to you and to give thanks. This is not a message only for one or the other. It's a message for both of us, and so would you speak it to us, Spirit of God, press it into the hearts of every single person here and move us towards you, move us into faith, and that a, a saving faith. That's where joy is found. In faith closed up tight to you. And so I'm asking, Father, would you bless this people here? Would you show yourself to us in, in your goodness and, and build in us and build in us the deepest, truest joy? So give clarity to my words this morning and give clarity to our, our listening and thinking. Spirit, would you own this? Would you drive out all distractions? And would you make the word clear? Lift up Christ before us. Honor his name and build your church, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
turn our attention this morning to the middle of Luke chapter 18 and another parable told by Jesus. This chapter also began with a parable, one whose main point was easy to discern because it was told to us from the start. Christians should be a praying people, people who persist in crying out to God and who don't, live, and who don't lose heart and, and give up. That's the clear point found in verse 1. And then what follows in the parable and in the explanation all works to kind of move us towards that conclusion by reinforcing for us in our minds several important points. We are the elect of God, his chosen ones upon whom he has placed his steadfast love. And his love in election has as its goal our full and final salvation, justice done for us fully and finally one day at the end and even in part now in this life too and because he is the righteous god he himself also very much wants justice done wants rightness pressed into the world he's about that rightness done for us for his own glory and so he will not be thwarted and will not go back on his electing intentions but will indeed accomplish them That's all great motivation for us to approach him in in prayer, to ask him to do these things. He is totally unlike the judge in that parable. Totally unlike how the judge is and how the judge views that persistent widow. He's quite the opposite, in fact. And, And seeing that and remembering that is what moves us to draw near to him and, like the widow, to persist in asking him. Persist in prayer. Even when he delays another issue that comes up last week. Because if we're going to talk about persisting in prayer and and, and not giving up, that eventually will bring us face to face with the question of delay. Why, if all this is true about God and and who God is and, and what he wants and how he views us as people, why is there any delay between asking and receiving? Why why any gap? We touched on this last week as well. And Jesus' last comment, we noted, brings, brings up an answer that's important for us to consider. God sometimes requires persistence. He sometimes delays in the answering and requires persistence because he wants to address our truest, deepest need, our, our need for communion with him. And as we persist in faith, that issue is both addressed and then and then answered. As we persist in faith, we, we meet him. We, we commune with God in faith. Or we don't and trust something else. That's the issue sometimes raised for us by, by this delaying. Do you actually believe me? And what I said about me and what I said about you and what I'm about. Or will you actually turn and trust something else to deliver what you think you need? The issue of faith is addressed in the delay. So we considered all this last week and why sometimes he waits, seeing that we should persist in faith and praying and depending on him to give us what we need apart from whom we can do nothing. That was last week. And that's kind of the connection to the passage this week. The the subjects of prayer and, and dependence and believing that we cannot do and be what we need to be and what we need done, those topics kind of bridge over into today's passage. The world does not think that apart from him we can do nothing. Humanity typically thinks of itself as much more capable. And to some who were very confident in themselves and their own abilities, particularly in their own abilities to make themselves right before God, right in the eyes of others, in fact, too. To such ones, Jesus told another parable, our passage today. So let me read that parable and then the couple of verses that follow in the next section because they are, they are related in subject. So I'm going to read verses 9 to 17 and then draw out two observations from them. It's Luke 18, beginning in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous 
and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The word of the Lord in Luke 18. Two observations, here's the first. It is impossible to stand acceptable to God based on our own efforts. It is impossible to stand acceptable to God based on our own efforts. Verse 9, Jesus is speaking to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and then also, therefore, they treated others with contempt. They are thinking that they are righteous before God the judge, that rightness, righteousness, characterizes them, and that that rightness, that righteousness, is because of themselves. Notice they are confident in themselves and what they do. This is self-righteousness, or in theological terms, works righteousness. A righteousness that I myself have attained, I am righteous because of what I do. What I have done. That's what Jesus is speaking to, and the target here, it's, it's negative. He's criticizing something here. And so the first point for us here this morning, it is also negative. It is pointing out that the idea of self the idea of works righteousness, a righteousness that I gain based on my personal effort, it is a failure. It's incorrect. It's wrong. So I'm working on something negative here this morning. As I prayed, I said we got to have two parts. We got to listen to two parts here. So we got to listen to the first part in in its in its truth. It's negative. To see. This doesn't work, and to think a little bit about why not, what's, what's in it, what, what, is it, what does it produce, what's negative about it, and then we move to the positive later. Jesus tells a story. Two men go to the temple and they pray, and they are clear models, almost stereotypes, of what society would regard as good people and bad people. You've noticed before, tax collectors were universally hated then because they were kind of like legally protected thieves, empowered to collect tax for the government and more for themselves. Everybody hated them. They're the bad people. And the Pharisee, of course, the highly religious one, highly observant, publicly he would be very upstanding and ethical, very concerned for God's word, very exacting and careful to apply it. He's the good. There's one of each, good and bad. They both go to the temple to pray, and the good man prays what seems like a prayer of thanksgiving, but it's really a prayer of affirmation, a prayer of personal affirmation, affirming how good he himself is, certain of it, sure that he has earned by his good behavior commendation from God, sure that he stands acceptable in the sight of God, able to stand next to God, so to speak, and with his arm around God's shoulder, look at all the other people out there and judge them. That's where he is. 
That's the person Jesus is talking to here. He's speaking to that kind of person. A very common way of conceiving of God and how to be acceptable before him. Now, as Jesus paints it, it's, it is perhaps a bit unique, a bit over the top, because we hear his prayer, and, and we probably wouldn't find many people who would pray exactly like that, who would pray to God, boasting of themselves over other people. So it's a bit over the top to be, to be clear where the mindset is, but it is nonetheless a common way of conceiving of God and how to be acceptable before him. God is pictured as one who commands right and wrong. He commands right and, and wrong. It says what to do. And then there is therefore a divide be, in humanity between people who, who line up with God and God's requirements and those who don't. It's right there in verse 12. God requires humility and denying of himself, of oneself. I do that. I fast twice a week. God requires tithing, I do that too. Of everything, I'm really careful. All that I receive, I calculate a tenth and I put it in the offering plate. He requires, he requires, I do. It's also in verse 11, indirectly. God forbids extortion and injustice and sexual sin and legal theft, and I don't do any of that, nor do I go with girls who do. I'm good. Here's the requirement, and I do it. Here's the forbidden, and I don't do it. That's the Pharisee's conclusion. And because of that, I stand righteous and acceptable before God. And so, surely, I'm better than other people, too. Thank God I'm not like the rest of these people. I'm good. This is works righteousness. Diligently pursued, and so he thinks, successfully pursued. Confidence in self within a works righteousness mindset. A work, here's what's required, I do, I'm good. That's the Pharisee. Pharisaism. But let's keep thinking about this because that mindset is also present in other places in the world. Ironically, in many of the people that the Pharisee is pointing his finger at and accusing, it's in them too, just the same. It's wearing different clothes, for sure, but it's the same mindset. Remember the mindset, here's what God requires, there's a divide, and I do it. I'm on this side, I'm on the correct side of the ledger. That's the idea of works righteousness. Pharisee's looking down on people. He says, here's the standard of God, and I'm going to keep it, and you know what? I think I do, and you people who don't are deplorable. But some of the people he's pointing his finger at would say, well, there's the standard of God, and there's no way I can keep that. And you people who try to require me to do that are deplorable, you Pharisees. So forget the standards, forget the rules. Any God who wants to tell me who I can have sex with and how I can make money and spend it and how I have to give it and how I'm allowed to dress and what language I can use and whether or not I can marry who I want to or divorce when I feel like it, any God who tells me that's, that's what I have to do to be acceptable to him, I don't need that. And besides, comma, and besides, I'm a good enough person. I've never killed anybody, I don't steal, and I'm a loving person. Oh, there it is. The same mindset. I reject your opinions of what God requires of me, and I set up my own opinions of what I think God requires. What God really requires is that we be non-murderers, non-thieves, and generally nice people. I'm a good person. How dare you tell me I'm not? Notice that carefully. It's the same mindset. It's the same mindset in, in very much different clothing. In fact, these two people are going to completely disagree with each other and probably treat one another with equal contempt. 
The, the Pharisee and the non-Pharisee have the same mindset, though. They both are looking at, here's a God, in my conception, a God who says, I require something or another, and I think I've probably met that. And I'm probably good enough. That's how God deals with all of the world. He issues a standard. We meet it. And if we meet it, as we meet it, then we are good in his eyes and good in our own eyes before one another. They look so very different, but Pharisees and extortioners and adulterers and tax collectors and ordinary Americans are actually conceiving of God in the same way. He gives us a standard. And if and as we meet it, we are acceptable to him. So meet it and be acceptable to him. We pick our own standards. In fact, all the religions of the world pick our own standards. The non-religious of the world pick our own standards. We meet them, call ourselves good, and think we're fine. It's all works righteousness. The whole world thinks along the lines of works righteousness. It's a big issue and it is a troubling one. Think of the problems that this view of God, this view of what makes us right, righteous, creates. Between people, it is often the root of arrogance and judgmentalism. Jesus actually identifies that specifically. Verse 9, he says, They treated others with contempt, and as Jesus tells the parable, you can certainly hear that on the Pharisees' lips, his view of the other people out there that he's not like. There is so much pride there, contempt, an ugly attitude that is at least unloving and hard to live with, and at worst, leads to religious persecution and religious suppression of others and even religious wars at times. This is the thing the world's afraid of, about people who are really committed to some religious perspective. Afraid that this commitment to perspective joined with a little bit of power is going to produce trouble. And it does. It always has. Between people, this mindset always produces trouble because we think we have established the standard and we have met it and them ones don't and they should. And there is judgment of them and, and condemnation of them and sometimes joined with power that creates trouble between people, but even within oneself. So think, think of not just between people, but within the person this perspective of what God bases acceptability on is terribly destructive for you. You think that you're doing well. Do you think you're meeting the standard or successfully avoiding the standard if it's a prohibition? And pride and self-confidence and a critical spirit and the frequent tearing down of others and negativity blossoms within you. Inevitably, how you are viewing God and how, how you think God stands over you and what God, how God deals with it, that's how you will then deal with other people as well. And as you see God's requirement and I'm meeting that and you're not, then you, in my mind, you are bad. And I will judge that. You will judge that. You will condemn that. You will pass a, a verdict over that person, over that person's life. And a critical spirit of judgmentalism will, will, will rise up and will take control of you. And an inward contempt for others who don't perform like they should it will characterize you until you yourself fall 
You find that you meet the standard, everything's good in your pride until you don't meet the standard and you fail in some way that you are surprised by. And as you're thinking, I don't do that. I'm not one of those people. I'm better than that. Then maybe you move over to the other side of the ledger where others of us live all the time. In fear and in despair and in anxiety, performing, 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 because that's how you get accepted. This view of how God deals with us, this works righteousness, will drive you to work, 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 and it will eat your lunch every day because you will never be good enough for long enough. You'll never be secure. You'll never stand at rest because you are always only as good as your present goodness, and you must keep that up the next day and the next day and the next day. If you ever drop the ball, if you ever fall down on the standards that you know God has set and by which he judges you, you will not be acceptable anymore. And so you must constantly perform and you fear that you will fail. You fear that you're missing some standard. You feel that you're falling down in some way hidden to you, but you will discover it one day when God rips the rug out from under you and condemns you. It is a terrible way to live. And it is common to man. The energy that you spend on performing and the energy you spend on keeping up appearances because everybody else must see that you are good. It is exhausting. And it is filled with deceit. Because in your heart of hearts, in in the quiet of the night, you know it's not true. You know you're a failure. It feels hollow to you as you smile. It's destructive. It creates problems between people. It creates great problems within us. Whether we think we're doing well or discover that we aren't, it creates problems within us. But worst of all is what we read in verse 14. Speaking of this Pharisee and the tax collector, who we'll come to in a moment, Jesus says, I tell you, there's that underlining of emphasis, I tell you, this is the way it is. Both men came to God to pray. Both said amen and went home. And one, only one of them, is in fact justified. Not the Pharisee. That word justified, it's hard to tell in English, but we talked about this a little bit last week. It's related to the word righteousness. They're they're in the same family of words justified, particularly in this context, it, it actually is an old equivalent to what we might, we might call acquitted or declared not guilty. It's a court term. You're either acquitted or found guilty. You're either justified or condemned. The verdict's. Only one of them went home justified. Not the one who viewed God as dealing with him in a works righteousness way. Not the one who thought he was good. He went home condemned. He attempts to stand on his own efforts and he falls. This is the greatest tragedy of all. interpersonal troubles and the inner and personal hardships and fears and insecurities, they all pale in comparison to this because here is one who is confident that she stands before God accepted, that she has found God's standard and met them, has exalted self and in, in the view of her, of her own eyes is good enough, has done well enough, but actually discovers in the end that she is condemned before the judge. It 
the world needs to hear this. This is how the world works. And it is a failure. It leaves us all, in fact, on every continent of every age, of every race, of every ethnicity, as we look to our own efforts and strive to reach whatever standards we think are, it leaves us falling short and condemned. It is common to think like this. It has been the way we think ever since the very beginning because in the very, very beginning, it was how God worked. And by very, very, very beginning, I mean Genesis 2, before the fall into sin. God laid out before us the garden and said, eat of everything you want here, except for that tree. Eat of everything you want here, and here's where you will stay with me. Clean, in fellowship, in the garden, in the presence of God, in what we might call now the kingdom of God, with him. Do this and you will live. But then Genesis 3 comes along and we fall into sin and our natures are bound, enslaved to sin. We still think that's the way it works, but it isn't. It seems like it but we fail to see that the law of God actually is given to us now to show us our failure, our inability to do what is required. Not to show us, do this and you will live, but do this and you would live, but you don't, so you can't. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the summary of what God requires. And then the Bible says, and let's be clear, there is no one righteous, no, not one. No one does it. Not a one of us. We are sinners through and through. We need a righteousness from outside of us to come to us. Nothing that we can generate from ourselves by our own efforts. Only something from outside of us that would come to us would enable us to stand acceptable before God. And it takes us to the next point. The first point is Jesus' criticism. His criticism of the world. But understand something very clearly. At, at, the, at the core of what's going on in the ministry of Jesus and, of, and in the ministry of Jesus now through his church, at the core of what's going on is not simply criticism. We get, we get a hint of this when you can read in John, the world stands, con Jesus did not come to condemn the world because the world stands condemned already. He didn't have to come and criticize the world. The world's already lost. Criticism is always for the sake of exposing to show failure, need, and solution that's other than what we thought. So we've got to hear the first part and hear the criticism and feel that falling on how we universally, as human beings, how we approach God to see that that does not work. It does not work between us, it does not work within us, and it does not work before God because fundamentally what it is is a, is a rising up and exalting of self that says, I can do it, never mind you. And God says, no, you can't, no, you don't, and I do not tolerate, never mind me. I'm the Lord. There's a criticism there. For the sake of seeing the second point. Acceptance before God comes as we humbly depend on Him for gospel mercy. 
Acceptance before God comes. It is possible for it to, to be received. For it comes as we humbly depend on him for gospel mercy. There are two characters in the parable. Obviously, we just considered the first. Now the second, the tax collector. He too has come to God in prayer, but verse 12, 13, he stood far off and would not even lift his eyes to heaven. Standing was the posture of prayer in that day. They're both standing. But one, eyes lifted to heaven, and the other one, eyes averted, head hanging low. If you were to see them, you would see a different posture. You would see an attitude on their bodies. He stands there, head hung low, beating his breast, Jesus says. Brief phrases, just brief phrases that, that show us someone who's come to pray, but is broken and grieved over himself, not confident in himself. That's what he looks like, and then what he prays confirms that God, thank you that I'm not a sinner like these other ones are. No, that's not what he prays. God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Here is a sinner who knows it and is grieved by it. He is not righteous, and of that he is confident. He deserves nothing, he merits nothing, he pleads only humble, eyes averted, asking for mercy from God, the righteous one. Mercy. Do not give to me, a sinner, what I deserve. What I deserve, I know. What I deserve is condemnation. I, I can never love you with everything in me, all of my all, and love my neighbors myself. I cannot and I have not. What I deserve is condemnation. There is no such thing as self-works righteousness. I am unrighteous. Please have mercy. He's broken, not exalting himself, but humbled and seeking mercy because he knows he cannot stand before God otherwise. He has no ability in himself. He is unable like a child is unable. He knows he needs to be given. He cannot produce. He cannot make. He cannot earn anything. Just like a child can't. He has a need to receive something from outside of him. And that attitude, that's the connection to the next several verses. People bringing little children to Jesus. Common in that day for people to bring kids to esteemed religious leaders, to have them bless them in some way, lay their hands on them, maybe pray for them, give them some sort of blessing. And the language says this was common. They were doing it. People were bringing even infants to him. It's going on with some repetition. And the disciples are bothered by it. Jesus says what to them? Let them come. Don't, don't stop them. Let them come. Which, yes, surely does show us that Jesus welcomes children. He's not put off by them or inconvenienced by them. And in a society that did not value kids like we do, we, we regard children as precious. That was not how they regarded children back then. So in that society in particular, it does do something of placing some worth on kids, some value on them, which is a bit surprising. But that is not why that's here. We, we can see it there, but that's not the point. It's here to show us something that lies very much in line with what we've just been looking at, what comes right before. How can one stand acceptable before God? How can one be welcomed into the presence of God, welcomed into the kingdom of God, cleansed of sin, brought near, not by our efforts? Middle of verse 16, don't stop the children from coming to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. To such ones, to people like this. Well, what is it about them? What, what, what is it like them, such as this? What, what's, what's noteworthy or commendable? Their, is it their age? Is it their, their size? Their mental capacity? No, of course not. Verse 17, 
Truly I say to you, again, similar emphasis from Jesus, uh, underlining emphasis. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What's commendable about the kids is the way they receive. The way they humbly, trustingly hear what they are told and believe it and accept it without suspicion, without guarded hesitancy. Parents have to tell kids, don't take candy from strangers. Because kids are very inclined to take candy from strangers. They're not suspicious. They don't doubt. They have, they have, no, they have no natural guard. But then when the parent tells them, they, they believe the parent, even though they don't really understand why not. Candy looks good. He smiled. He seemed nice. What's the problem? They don't get that either, but they believe the parent. Point is that children receive input from the outside in a simple, trusting way. To such ones as this, the kingdom comes. Those who receive humbly, who trust like a child, who can receive that which comes from outside and know that they have nothing to bring up from the inside. To such ones, Such ones belongs the kingdom. Such ones receive the kingdom and enter into it, carried into glory. That's the only way to stand acceptable before God, to receive from Him mercy, to receive from Him outside justification, outside declaring of non-guilt outside righteousness credited to my account all from the outside nothing from within that's what is needed and that's what God has provided in the gospel of Christ's cross Christ came to earth and he alone lived perfectly obedient to the law of God the only one who ever walked the earth who could say By what I do, I am righteous in the eyes of God. I don't need mercy. Give me justice, and I'm good. And he was. And he was condemned anyway. On purpose. That was the plan. He was righteous in the eyes of God. Righteous by what he did. Justified and yet condemned. On purpose, for the sake of all who, like children, will humbly and dependently ask God for mercy and grace. Mercy to take what we deserve, the condemnation that we deserve for our sin, and place it onto Christ who doesn't deserve it. And to place from him onto us his righteousness, his obedience to the law. So that before God we stand in Christ clean. This is the gospel. That our guilt as sinners has been laid on him and he has given to us from the outside a righteousness that is in Christ. And we receive it only when we say humbly, we have that posture of humble self. I have no hope in myself. I have nothing in me, no works in me that makes me righteous, only Christ does. So please have mercy on me. Please give me the kingdom. Please cleanse me. Oh God, from outside, work on me. And he does. And he does. The world needs to hear this too. And only when you hear the first point and are driven out of that and there is no hope in it, does does the glorious hope that is Christ's cross make any sense to us? We have no righteousness in ourselves, but we need it or we stand condemned. And here's a righteousness from Christ. Come to us, come to us, come to us. To be received with open hands like little children. Please, thank you. The world needs to hear that and to hear it as the only hope and to hear it as a real hope. It's how you can be saved and the only way that you can be saved. And you will be saved if as a sinner you cry out, God have mercy on me, 
save me. You will be saved. You will be placed in Christ, counted righteous in him because of him only, not because of you. This is good news. This is the hope of the gospel. The world needs to hear this. And so do we, the Christians in the room. He speaks to us in this too. Jesus' audience is not necessarily non-Christians. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. That's not necessarily not me. Think into this a little bit. If you're genuinely a Christian, you understand and you agree with and perhaps God has stirred you to to rejoice in and to thank him for everything that I've just said. The impossibility of standing before God in our own efforts, the, the glorious righteousness in Christ given to us, received by simple trusting faith. You see works righteousness as a destructive error. Yes, good, amen, but... Do you sometimes find yourself relating to God on these terms, this works righteousness mentality, nonetheless? You probably do. And so again, Christian, here's a criticism here that is never just for the sake of criticizing. It is never just for the sake of like knocking you down a peg. <laughs> Your father is not remotely interested in just knocking you down a peg just so you'll be knocked down a peg. He wants to humble you that you might be exalted. So listen to the criticism. Do you sometimes find yourself relating to God and to others based on this sort of a mindset, this works righteousness mindset? Check yourself. Do you think do you think, do you sometimes think that God thinks of you with different degrees of approval and pleasure or disapproval and displeasure? And that different degree is based on how you're doing today, this week, this month. Check yourself, perhaps, for some of those interpersonal or personal troubles that we looked at earlier. Do you struggle with pride and contempt? Critical and judgmental spirit. I know probably no Christians in this room have ever been judgmental or critical in spirit, but the world has a problem with the Christian church on that very grounds. Other Christian churches. Not to judge them or be critical of them. Right? It is easy for us to look at the messed up world all around us and even the messed up person sitting right next to you right now. And to shake our heads and mutter, arm around God's shoulder here, what's wrong with them? If only this slacker, this fool would shape up and get with the program. If this, if this immoral person, these immoral people, these, these sinful fools would just stop messing things up and, and see the wisdom of God's truth and submit to him and walk with him and, and and start serving in the church and, and stop tearing down the society all around us. Like, be better like me. That, that's, what, that's, how that, that's how that sentence ends. You just never say that part. And be better like me. See, that, you got to be standing on that ground to say that about those other people. 
the better like me ground. Or, or flip it over because it can go the other way. It can go the way away from the personal pride and the contempt of others. It can go towards if only I would be more obedient and more diligent in my study and more faithful and persistent in prayer. I mean, last week he talked about persisting in prayer and all I felt was just this weight of guilt on me because I don't pray, I don't pray, I don't pray, I don't pray. I'm just such a bad Christian. God certainly looks on me and he frowns on me. Clearly, he must be displeased with me. He must be criticizing me, and I have no one to criticize but myself because I'm the one who doesn't do it or does do what I shouldn't do. Because of my messed up self, I I am sure that God looks on me and frowns and is completely uninclined to bless me, to, to work with me, to help me because because look at me. I mean, I may, I may smile on the outside, but look at me. Self-critical and insecure and driven to performance because that's how you think you're acceptable and worthy in the eyes of God and, and before other people. Sometimes the most apparently faithful, the most apparently godly, the most apparently theologically astute, sometimes even the person you think of as a theology cop in your little, your little circle, the guy who's always, the gal who's always like correct, no, that's not what it is, that's not what it is, it's this, this, that person is the most insecure and the most trapped in this mindset. Sometimes. I got to get it right, and so do you. I got to get, I got to be right, and so do you, because that's how God views us, me and you. So is that you? Christian works righteousness, lives in the corners of most of our hearts because it is part and parcel of the fallen human nature. It is universal. It's how we are. And we are redeemed people who still are in part how we are. We've been saved, but not fully, completely so. And so we still have the flesh. We still have fallen nature, and part and parcel of fallen nature is works righteousness. So notice it, be alert, and realize this. Right there in all those moments of the insecurity and the fear and the anxiety and the theological policing and the judgment of others in the world and in the next pew, right there, right there, right there, right there, you've got your finger on a gospel problem. Right there. Your pride and your unloving, uncharitable contempt of others, it comes from how you still, even as a Christian, overlook the gospel, the given, the credited, the theological term, imputed righteousness of God placed on you such that he always looks on you as clean. You forget that you overlook it and are prone to slide into works righteousness as the operative way of how you deal with God. This is the criticism that is never is not intended in this moment or ever to, to just tear you down, knock you down a peg, but to release you from it and show you something else glorious. The answer is not then don't treat people with contempt, love them. That's a true statement. That's a law statement. Did you hear it? Do this. Don't treat people with contempt, love them. And if in your mind that gets slotted right in the same way, as, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay, I'm going to try to do that. And you miss the gospel piece of it, that's not going to help you. The answer is not be confident. Be nice. It is rather come like a child humble. Believe and receive afresh the righteousness that God provides, not by your own effort. Receive from him lasting favor on you. There is a life of Christian joy to be lived. And it 
it will begin, maybe it will begin again to flow to you in, in a new way. If you will hunt down and root out the residue of works righteousness that's in the corner of, corners of your lives. It's stuck there in your heart it, and it throttles out. When, when it lives and, and, and kind of takes the, the control of our hearts, it, it throttles out the joy of your salvation. So Christian, hear the good news here. Like, hear it fresh like a child. Hear it like it would wash over that man beating his breast in the church with his head cast down, recalling all of his sin. It would wash over him like cleaned, go home justified. That message to you, Christian, this morning, go home justified with no condemnation resting on you, and that not at all because of anything in you, because of the grace of God for you. This is good news. This is good news. And Christians need to preach it to ourselves all the time, all the time, because in our flesh, all the time, living with us, seeking to rise up, control us, and choke out our joy in life is the idea that God looks at me based on what I'm doing and how I'm doing. He looks at you because of what Christ did. And the banner that hangs over you is one of delight and joy and love. It is that kindness that does indeed move us to repentance. Holiness is an issue that Christians have to talk about. We talk about it from the standpoint of one who is accepted delighted in, rejoiced in, and cannot be more so. When Jesus says that the Father loves you with the love he has for me, there isn't any greater love. He won't love you more. He can't love you more. From that place we face sin and deal with it. We should not think that the tax collector went home and carried on in his old ways. He knew he was a sinner. He certainly addressed sin and wanted to repent and grow. Yes, indeed. But he does that from the standpoint of one who is justified and accepted. Christian, you are too. How humbling and freeing and good it is. That, that has nothing to do with you. It has come from outside of you. And as you humble yourself, you will find yourself exalted in the presence of God, welcomed into the kingdom and living in its joyful life. Hear this and believe it, Christian. Christian. Hear this and believe it, Christian. Let me pray. Lord, the gospel is good. It is amazingly good. And it is true. This faith delivered to us from you is so different from what rises up inside of us. And it is so good. Thank you that it is true. That Christ was born in Bethlehem of a virgin. He grew up and lived a sinless life. He walked, he healed, he taught. He went to Jerusalem and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried and rose again. This is the gospel and it is true. He has ascended and he sits in heaven at the right hand and is waiting to come again to the earth to finally and fully deliver us, to judge the whole earth, the living and the dead, and to bring righteousness to this place. It is true. And we who by grace have been given the righteousness of Christ stand justified and eager for him to come. Help us to walk now with him here and to look for his appearing, our great hope. Or would you send your people home aware that they are justified, believing it and walking in it? 
and those perhaps here who don't know you, would you show them their need and show them this as the true hope and save them? Bring them to the kingdom too. This is our prayer and we pray it in Christ's name, our good and gracious and kind and merciful Savior. Amen.